Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Sevgi. Uh, I talk very fast, and this is going to compress about 30 years of uh, ideas into about 10 or 15 minutes, so we might as well begin. Uh, disclosures are on that slide. So here's, this is probably the most important slide in this talk. We, it is axiomatic that we pretty much understand how HIV is transmitted. And that is that an infected person has a swarm of virus, and that swarm has two important features. That's on the left-hand side of this slide. The swarm is in the genital mucosa, or in, the in, in general mucosa, and the swarm has its own phenotypic features, um, which are going to be important in the probability of a transmission event. But more, and, and in that swarm, generally, no two viruses are exactly alike because as HIV replicates, it loses fidelity, or it lacks fidelity, and there's a concentration. And, the, and over the years, we've learned that both the phenotype of the virus and the concentration of the virus will determine the probability of a transmission event, the thing we want to avoid. There is a bottleneck that we don't understand. So there's a huge concentration of virus, and then ultimately, um, most people only acquire one or two viral copies, viral uh, pseudotypes, and that's the blue on the right-hand side, where 80 percent of people get one virus. And that one virus, of course, has caused an infection, and it's ready to go to the next person. That's quite clear, because we see clusters of infection. So that's the transmission event. Now, as was noted earlier, uh, Judy, who's with us, uh, in the ver and, and many of us have worked on this a very long time, Judy uh, and her colleagues use the tools of epidemiology to demonstrate the overlap between HIV and SCDs at an epidemiology, uh, classical SCDs. And it was pretty clear that there was some sort of a synergy and that it was probably biological in nature, not just behavioral. Um, and that's something I'll talk about over the course of this talk. This is, this is just to remind me that something can go wrong when you mix things together, the double liquor and the guns together. That's like mixing a SCDs and HIV. That's my metaphor for a bad thing happening. So, um, in terms of the, the problem, in terms of the transmission event, there's two ways we need to think about. We need to understand the person who's HIV infected remains infectious in the absence of treatment, and the probability they'll infect the next person is shown on the left-hand side, and we'll be especially concerned about two things, the genital tract viral load and inflammatory STDs that we know will increase the genital tract viral load. On the right-hand slide is the susceptibility of someone. And the susceptibility is going to be affected by a number of factors, but the most important factors are going to be inflammation, and because the inflammation is going to reduce barriers to infection, and ulcers, because that will make available uh, many more cells for infection and deeper tissues. Joanne Passmore, I think, is talking at the, I know is talking at this meeting, and others, her group and others' groups have spent a lot of time trying to understand the specific cytokines that increase susceptibility. And the argument is it's not just any infection that increases susceptibility, it's a particular menu of cytokines that will increase susceptibility. I would refer you to her work to see which cytokines she thinks are the most important. Now, one of the big surprises, I think, in the HIV epidemic in terms of male acquisition of HIV, which could be acquired among gay men in a couple of ways, it could certainly be acquired through unprotected anal intercourse, and you can imagine that the rectum is incredibly heav heavily defended against infection. And it's all those cells that are constantly uh, eliminating the, the minor breaks in the, uh, the the consequences of minor breaks in mucosa that are available for uh, HIV acquisition after insertive anal intercourse. But one of the surprises is was the foreskin, and it's pretty clear that it's not the urethra. Most STD experts are focused on the urethra, especially those of us who've worked on gonorrhea and chlamydia. That the urethra, which I think for at least 10 years we thought was the critical player is not the critical player. It's, it's the foreskin, an inflammation in the foreskin um, that allows acquisition. And uh, several groups have shown that in the face of some STDs um, that cause inflammation around the foreskin, you see increased numbers of cells available for acquisition and greater acquisition. Now, um, for, the, for susceptibility to HIV, so Many groups have demonstrated the concentration required in the swarm for transmission. 
Most investigators believe when you're below 1,000 copies, 1,000 or 1,500 copies of HIV in the swarm, that a transmission event will not occur. However, STDs in the person who might acquire HIV lower the barrier to the swarm. And how they do that is not entirely clear, but at least a couple of investigators in serious papers demonstrated that the replication fitness, the strength of the virus that, uh, that is transmitted in the face of an STD is lower. It's a wimpier virus than in the absence of an STD. So you, you, you always got to consider the viral phenotype and the swarm. And as I've said, we tend to focus on the number 1,500 copies, and we know a lot about the kinds of viruses that are transmitted. And this is just from the same paper explaining the kind of details of how the investigators in a very complex way proved that the virus that was transmitted was wimpier because of uh, a concomitant inflammatory STD. And for this meeting, what's come up already is a phenomenon um, that we don't understand completely. Um, and that is, if a person who's HIV negative shows up in a clinic with an STD, whether it's rectal gonorrhea or primary secondary syphilis, uh, that, that is a harbinger, that is a predictor that that person might acquire HIV in some coming period of time at a much greater rate than would otherwise be anticipated. So in this particular study uh, uh, pro provided by the people in New York City, one in 15 gay men uh, who had rectal gonorrhea had HIV within a year, uh, one in 18 gay men um, who were diagnosed with primary secondary syphilis had HIV in a year, and this leads uh, Jean-Michel, who's here, will probably say something about this in his, in his own talk. So is this harbinger because behaviors go unchecked, or is there something biological that we don't understand that's going to occur concomitantly, like another episode of syphilis or another episode of gonorrhea that lower the barrier to the exposure that would otherwise have allowed HIV to be acquired? Now, the, the, I think for, for this group, it's hard to overestimate the importance of looking for acute HIV or recognizing that an STD may, that the person with a classical STD may also have undetected acute HIV infection. And the reason that's important is because increasingly the HIV community is concerned about treating people during acute infection, getting ready to cure people, and also because the person with acute infection is maximally contagious and can build a cluster around them if they're untreated. So I would emphasize this relationship. The highest level of virus, oops, the highest viremia is shown here, and that's called ramp-up viremia, and that's the most virus that person's going to have in their lifetime for the, is during that acute infection. In studies in Africa that we've done over many years, we use STDs as one of the markers to predict that somebody has acute HIV infection along with some other markers. So it's the people in STD clinics who ultimately in whom we detect uh, acute HIV infection. So now let's move to infectiousness. And for infectiousness, it, as I've already said, the person who's infected, who's untreated, has a swarm of virus at the mucosal surfaces that's available for the next person. That swarm of virus can be uh, in, the, in the rectum, uh, it can be in the genital secretions, the semen or the female genital secretions. Um, and the problem we've run into is, I think at the beginning of treatment as prevention ideas, we anticipated that when we told people they were HIV infected, when we told them they were HIV infected, that perhaps the behaviors would change so dramatically that it wouldn't get SCDs. Study by Kalichman and many other similar studies show knowing you have HIV doesn't mean you're not going to get another STD. And this is just Kalichman's earlier study of point prevalence of different STDs. I'd refer you to pull his paper. He shows you the probability that a person who knows they're HIV infected will come to a clinic with an untreated STD and require treatment. Um, the untreated STD then increases the concentration of HIV, and this is a very old slide from 97, but many other investigators have replicated the fact that in the genital secretions, an untreated STD will increase the concentration. This is a gonorrhea study. Gonorrhea in somebody with HIV in Africa, much higher level that could be lowered with treatment over a period of weeks. Now, as I move towards the close of all these comments, so we have infectiousness and susceptibility. And I can say unequivocally that in the time where in the early days, 
um, where we were most concerned about this synergy, we thought we could treat the SCDs and get rid of HIV. And that was a really good idea, by the way. There's nothing wrong with the idea. But the, the, I still embrace the idea. Uh, however, and the studies that were done, one study worked and other studies didn't work, and many review articles have, been, have written about why treatment of SEDs might or might not work uh, to prevent HIV transmission events. The problem really is, in order for you to treat SEDs to get rid of HIV, you've got to treat just the right people at just the right time with just the right drugs for the appropriate duration. It's pretty clear that only the Mwanza study really met these criteria. It's very difficult to treat genital herpes at exactly the right time, and that laid, loomed large in this whole issue. So to my knowledge, there are no ongoing trials of directly treating STDs to prevent HIV, except for the idea of prophylaxis, which uh, John Michelle might get into. So what happens with ART? So ART, it, there's the good news and the bad news, and this is now an opinion. The good news is ART turned out to be great. It turned out to be great for treatment, to let, let people have normal lives, and it turned out to be great because it could prevent the onward transmission of HIV. And the copies that we detect, the small numbers of copies we detect in genital secretions in people on ART, they seem not to be contagious. That is, the U equals U campaign, undetectable is uninfectious, seems to be an excellent campaign, really important for stigma and everything else. So ART turned out to be great for that. ART also turned out to be great as pre-exposure prophylaxis for people who took Truvada reliably. It, and what's amazing about the drug in both, the ART in both directions is its ability to withstand STDs. So when we first got Truvada pre-exposure prophylaxis, there was a fear that oh, STDs in the person taking Truvada for pre-exposure prophylaxis, the STDs would overwhelm the Truvada. That's really not proven true. Now that has to be proven for new ART. So as we get new PrEP agents, each one has to prove it's resilient against SCDs. But this slide summarizes all these studies that endorse the idea that ART has been a great, obviously, earth-shaking breakthrough. However, it, it seem, it, I think unequivocally, it's changed the mindset of people about H, uh, uh, HIV, the danger of getting HIV, and I think it's affected, my opinion is it's affected sexual behavior enough to at least contribute to the increasing spread of the classical STDs. And the siloing of the STD community and the HIV community has not been good to kind of resolve this problem. CDC just recently published a, a, a review, a, 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 a MMWR, indicating that providers giving PrEP don't measure for STDs at the anti anticipated or required rate. That's an example of a missed opportunity in the synergy of these fields. So historically, the synergy we talked about was the HIV-STD synergy. The synergy we, we really need is the provider synergy. We need the STD-HIV provider synergy to have a positive impact. Genital tract shedding, I've already indicated, occurs, and we don't think it's really critical. It will become critical to the cure field. Where that residual virus is coming from is going to have to be understood to cure HIV. Where do we go from here? SDs have their own serious consequences. That came up this morning. It is not acceptable for us to leave them alone because the consequences in reproductive health are grave uh, for both men and women. Uh, TASP and PrEP. They overwhelm the classical STDs, and that's a wonderful thing, but with the consequence I've mentioned. We anticipate the detection of acute infection in STD clinics, and, and one must be aware of the signs and symptoms of that. And then lastly, this afternoon and tomorrow, gonorrhea and syphilis are special, and they deserve the attention they're receiving at this meeting. For gonorrhea, we see this remarkable incidence. We see extra genital infections at a rate that I don't believe existed 20 years ago, although we weren't measuring it 20 years ago. And we see the increasing resistance that's been emphasized by everybody in this room, even to the drug ceftriaxone. For syphilis, we see a remarkable incidence. It, both of these agents are clearly a harbinger to HIV. Why they're a harbinger really needs to be understood. And then the prophylaxis to prevent infection or HIV is a topic I'm sure we're going to discuss this afternoon. So thank you. I talked really fast. I apologize, but now I'm done. Thank you.